Uh, and I, I want to talk to you about so the disruption that language AI is going to bring, right? So if you think about language AI, um, we define it as helping computers really understand uh, and manipulate as well as interpret human language, right? And when you think about what is a disruptive technology, well, it's effectively an innovation that significantly alters the way consumers as well as industries or businesses operate, right? And it's usually produced by startups and by entrepreneurs, right? They're trying to disrupt something that hasn't worked the way they thought or they found a problem that really had a new solution through the use of technology. And I'm going to argue today that recent developments in language AI um, from large language models uh, using transformer uh, architectures, for example, or even graph neural networks, all these are poised to become the next disruptive innovation, right? And I do think that it resembles those of other major um, inventions uh, in their own times. So just take the invention of the battery, right? In 1800, um, the physicist Alessandro Volta invented the battery. And what he did is he just simply stacked disks of copper uh, and zinc and separated them by a cloth soaked in water. But he proved to create the first reliable source of electricity. Now, without this conception, uh, we wouldn't have computers, right? We wouldn't have communication devices. There would be no vehicles, right? It was an essentially disruptive technology that created so many opportunities for us. And I don't think Alessandro Volta thought back then that the battery would be a key part of the energy transition, right, from fossil-based to carbon zero, right, 200 years later. When you think about uh, the first telegraph message 176 years ago, this was in May 24th, uh, uh, I think May 24th, uh, 1844, where the first message that was sent uh, that said, what has God made? Right? That's, that's what the message said. And the telegraph disrupted the way people communicated. Right? And it disrupted many different industries, including the news business. Right? Uh, it moved from being hyper-local to global. Uh, and it also disrupted capital markets. Right? It was the first time that you can send a trade from London to New York right? without having to send a message over, uh, over a ship. Right? It really made the world a smaller place. Right? And it took decades right, for the telegraph to really make a mark. Um, and we saw it progress very slowly. But nonetheless, it was the foundation for many of the modern inventions that we use today to communicate. If you think about the invention of the telephone, Arguably, Alexander Graham Bell and patented the first telephone, and he sent a human voice uh, over a wire. And back then, there was a company called Western Union. It was the biggest telegraph um, uh, company out there. But they were exposed to the telephone and yet rejected the idea, and they rejected to buy Bell's patent. They thought they had no commercial opportunities. Right? Now, Bell's invention really disrupted their business. right? Uh, and it was a major way of making things easier for people to, to communicate. Even businesses were able to communicate in ways that they never did. Um, it also reduced travel time. It reduced cost. Eventually, every industry in the world was disrupted by the telephone. Now, it didn't come without its problems, right? The telephone first uh, marveled people, but at the same time, you could hear noise. Right? There was static. It was very difficult to hear the other side. Um, so they were very noisy. Uh, they required a human operator. Uh, so there was no privacy in using the telephone. Uh, you didn't even have a dial. So you have to wait for someone to help you connect to the other party. Uh, it didn't go anywhere. It wasn't mobile either. Uh, but it took you know, a couple hundred years to really develop right, uh, into what it is today. Now, if we push back towards the first uh, concept of a machine, of a thinking machine, and we probably know Alan Turin's famous uh, test, which is effectively a way of testing a machine's ability to inhabit, uh, exhibit intelligent behavior, right? And the idea was that you would communicate over a teleprinter, and if the machine would answer you back just like a human, then it would pass the Turin test. And of course, there's been many variations of that test later on, but it was the first time that we thought about how do we use language to communicate with a machine, right? And we created uh, the first, uh, Programming language. Uh, this was the release of Lisp. And Lisp was the basis of, of all work for AI. Right? It was created by John McCarthy. Uh, he's a founding father, considered a founding father of AI. And Lisp as a programming law, uh, uh, language offers a lot of flexibility for organizations. Right? It's actually one of the foundational programming languages, and many of the descendants that you know today came out of Lisp. 
In fact, Ravenpack still uses Lisp uh, as well as other companies, and we probably have one of the biggest Lisp code bases in the world after the NSA. Uh, now, it's fair to say that you know, language AI effectively went through some really tough times. There were many different you know, ideas about what it could be done, but many of them failed to deliver on the promise, right? And it was about 50 years ago that it was considered dead, right? Most of the funding was, was uh, halted as a result of that, right? It had really overpromised what it could do, uh, but it truly underdelivered. Uh, there were computers called the Perceptrons, right? And the Navy revealed this embryo of a computer where they said that it would be able to talk, it would be able to see, it would write, it would reproduce itself and be conscious of its existence, right? So this high expectations of what machines and programming would do, but then Little did we know that in the back end, you would actually have these individuals manipulating a lot of the processes that were happening, right? Um, so we had computers doing you know, some really interesting things, but again, it led to disappointment, it led to criticism, and the failed technologies led to severe cutbacks in funding. So we turned over to the personal computer, right? We started focusing on the consumer. And it was interesting that back then, Time Magazine altered their annual tradition of naming the man of the year uh, to name the personal computer the machine of the year, right? It's a symbol that computers were here to stay and they were going to disrupt the way we practically did everything. Computers became personalized. They were brought down to scale. They transformed work, right? The irony of this is that the main writer of Time Magazine actually typed everything in a typewriter, right? Uh, in order to produce this, this version. It took him three years to upgrade to a word processor um, to, uh, before Time Magazine you know, caught up to the times. But it's true that the word processor was one of the bigger transformative programming services. It made really people productive. It was the first call it productivity software, right? Uh, and it changed the way we wrote. It created some of the most amazing uh, pieces of work and literature and research that we've uh, read recently, but it also digitized human language communications. Right? And as we turn back to this century, right, language AI is back, I think, from extension. Right? There's companies from Silicon Valley um, to uh, Marbella, Spain, uh, where Ravenpack is founded, where, the, where NLP is really recovering its thrive. Right? And we're starting to pick up on these broken expectations and getting things to work again. Funding is, is really starting to feed the creation of many of these different services, and research is becoming global, right? Um, so there are three things that I'd like you to take from my talk today about where we are, right? For language AI to really become this disruptive technology, we really need to be hyper-focused on training, right? And we recognize that language AI models are as good as the data they are trained on, right? That is, that is key. The second point is quilting knowledge graphs, right? Now what this means is ensuring that we create taxonomies that add context to the problems that we're trying to solve. If we're trying to understand financial language, we need a financial taxonomy. If we're trying to understand healthcare or medical resources, we need a medical taxonomy, right? And taxonomies add context, they add order, uh, and they will add depth to any machine learning training that you ever want to do. The third thing is really learning how to scale language models. Right? Now, to, we need to speed up the training of these different models. We need to make deployments of these LL, uh, large language models simple, what we call LLMs, uh, transparent and cost effective. For example, we're developing something called Ravenbert, right? Uh, it's our own version of Google's famous open source model. Uh, and this is pre-trained with Ravenpack's extensive news um, archive. So it's looking at specifically financial news to train this model to be good at understanding financial language, right? And we use Ravenbert embeddings um, to train sentence BERT models, which are creating embeddings that represent everything at the sentence level, and then we group up, right? So we're investing heavily in finance domain specific, and we think anybody that is trying to solve problems within our space needs to train their models specifically for the problems at hand. 